namo tassa bhagavato arahato namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Retreat series, Dhamma Talk number 28. Okay, there are three types of training in Buddhism. The first one is, we call it three pillars. The first one is dana, generosity. So in generosity, what really it's intends is how to relate, how to communicate, how to live with the people around you, with others, in peace and harmony. That's the intention of dana. Because when you look at it, whenever you give, Whenever you share, people love that person, people like that person. So that is the direct result of dana. So in other words, dana can be looked as it is a way how to have a harmonious, peaceful society how to be relating with people in peace and harmony. That's the intention, the main thrust of dana is. And sila is morality. And sila is here is how to refrain yourself so that it doesn't hurt or harm others. The first is communication. The second one is trying to draw the boundaries so no hurt, harms, or violence may fall upon you or for others. That's a sila. <clears throat> it's a basically behavior patterning or behavior change. The first is a beha- you change the, or you pattern the behavior so that you and the others could live in happiness and peace and harmony, how to live in the normal world. Second one is behavior change, behavior modification, okay, in terms of deed and speech. And here is the main thrust, is how to draw boundary so that non-violence can prosper no hurts and harms can come. So that is the thrust. And the third one is bhavana. And bhavana is, the Buddha doesn't just simply leave it as the behavior changes based on deed and speech and happy communication. He knows the, the depth of all things. The seed of all things starts from a thought. So, bhavana is the behavior modification on a mental level. Thoughts, the seed. So in here, of course, it's the samatha. Samatha is, it's very narrowed, very tunnel vision. It doesn't spread and cover the all aspects of humanity. It is very narrow, very eternal vision, but it strife for the highest level, okay, almost highest level of purity. Okay. It transcends from the thought level. 
but it approaches more on a base of a controlled, total control basis. And another bhavana is vipassana bhavana. Vipassana bhavana is not a very narrow, in fact, it spread around the whole world. It spreads in all direction. Okay? It teaches you how to cover the whole universe, so to speak, the physical okay, of a lesser, the, the world of beings, the world of mind, to spread and to cover the whole thing, but changes modified from the seat level. That is the trust of the Vipassana Bhavana. <clears throat> and here too, it strives. What is this striving part? This Bhavana is to get the supreme kind of kusala or wholesomeness, supreme or the highest level of wholesomeness. There are wholesomeness, kusala of many various levels degree, but this one aim for the highest, the most supreme. That's the Vipassana Bhavana is <coughs> striving for. So we talk about this Bhavana in the last Dharma talk in detail. <coughs> and in here we have this training, the three training, okay? Training of generosity, training of morality, and training of mental culture or mental development, the three trainings. And the three trainings, the third one goes right to the seat level, which is a thought level, and still trying to attain the highest level of kusala, wholesomeness. So, there's a training. Basically, these are the techniques or methods it gives you there. Thus, these techniques and methods are useless if there's nobody is practicing it. So there are people who practice it. Okay? A few people practice to that level of the bhavana kusala, which means the highest or supreme level of wholesomeness they practice. And in a concept level, the people who practice Okay. To that level are called yogi. The people who practice to acquire the highest level of kusala or wholesomeness, they are called yogi. So yogi is actually a combination of two words. One word is yoga and another word is e. Yoga and e. When you put the big together, it's called yogi. And what is yoga? Yoga is actually the application of energy or exertion. Application of energy or exertion to produce the the highest level of wholesomeness. Or application or exertion of energy <clears throat> to produce the purity of mind and the acquisition or attainment of wisdom. You exert or you apply energy to produce purity of mind and also the mind that have wisdom. That is what bhavana is or that is what yoga means, yoga. Actually, Y-O-G-A, we pronounce yoga, but in the West, we call it every day, everybody knows it, yoga, Y-O-G-A, the same thing. And here as we know as yoga. But that what yoga or yoga in a Buddhist is, that's what it means. 
application or exertion of energy to produce the highest level of wholesomeness or to produce the purity of mind with the mind with the wisdom. And of course there's another word, E. E is the possessor, the one who has it. So this yogi means the one who possesses the power to apply or exert the energy and produce the pure mind and the wisdom. That's what yogi is. We use the word yogi, we use the word yogi. But in a full sense, if you are called yogi, you must possess these qualities. You must possess these qualities. And if you possess these qualities, and if you apply, and if you exert, then you are a good yogi. If you don't have it, you are a yogi by name. Okay? You are a yogi by name only. But if you are a true one, that person possesses all these qualities we described in the yoga or yoga. <clears throat> so in here, the first one is what? Application or exertion of energy. Okay? So when you apply or exert energy, whenever you start it, there's always in everything, there's the beginning, the middle, and the end. The middle, the beginning, middle, and the end. And this exertion of energy too, you have the initial level or initial phase. In the initial phase, you apply energy, you apply exertion. Okay. And then here is to do what? In general, we just say to produce okay, purity of mind and wisdom. But more specific, you have to go step by step in a process, in the initial exertion. Let's look at our practice. When you're practicing, we always start with at the beginner class, especially rising and falling, rising movement and falling movement, rising movement and falling movement. Not much yet. Of course, according to definition, one must be able to observe anything and everything, whatever is arising at the present moment. But when you start, you don't jump into that level right away. If you jump in there, you won't be able to manage it quite well. So in the initial level, you just start small, baby step, rising movement and falling movement. Just simply focus on that. And of course, other things come in, you note it, but always okay, focus more on simply this rising and falling movement. Focus to up to a certain level so that you can continuously follow this, the two movements, rising movement and falling movement, expansion and contraction, expansion and contraction. Continuously, not once or twice or three times, continuously. That is your training ground, that's your initial place. And of course, you don't restrict to it. Even though say focus, give emphasis on it, you don't restrict to it. When other object comes in, you still observe. But your primary, primary focus is on this. And that is where your initial phase is. Just apply, apply so that you can follow. What happened was that will give you to be able to harness your mind, especially for people who have never meditated before. The mind is really wild, it's run, it disperses a lot. But in here, 
starting to tame that mind, and other was starting to put the leash on the mind so that it wouldn't stray too far from the central post. And here's the central post is this rising movement and falling movement on the initial phase. But at the same time, the leash has some length to it, which means along within that length, there are many objects come in, lifting, pushing, dropping, paying, and wandering a few emotions, but still focus on the rising and falling. And if you can do that quite successfully, you have come quite a bit in this initial stage. This initial phase is called Arama Datu. Okay, Arama Datu is the element, the phase or the element in which you are starting to train your mind. You are starting to develop your mind. You do that, and after a while, what happens is slowly and slowly you become used to it, it becomes quite easy. It becomes quite easy, but not to the point of easy become single-pointed and one-pointedness, because still there are many other objects come in, and as you become used to it, you become a little bit, it's become a little boring. That is the time this boredom set in, boredom set in, laziness set in, and then your focus become a little more dispersed. In other words, the mind started to wander, the mind strays away, more into the boredom and doldrum. So we can call it the second phase, okay, the phase of doldrum. You can call it the phase of doldrum, second phase. That phase is called nikama dadu. The mind started to run away. <clears throat> so the first one, Arama Datu, in here you have to exert energy, apply, so that the mind can stay in a, a small group of objects. Okay? Stay on there continuously, okay? uninterruptedly. And then after a while, you got into the doldrum stage and you pass away. And this second stage, second phase, doldrum phase, it's called Nikama Datu. In here, what you do was, you have to now okay, exert even more energy than before. You have to exert more energy. If you don't exert more energy, what happened was there are quite a lot of people around that time, they drifted away and gone. Okay, so, let's use an example and you are planting some, uh, let's say, tomato plants. You really yeah, prepare the soil, put some fertilizer, put some seed and properly, and in a few weeks they started to sprout and come and the plants grow. Great. So that is more like an initial phase. You prepare everything, you work hard, so that it really grows. As soon as it comes in, you become lax, and what happened? You don't take care of it, you don't water it, and then left it drift away, and the plant, that little plant will die. If it dies, what? All the energy that you put, all the work that you have put from the point of preparing the ground, putting the seed and fertilizer, everything you have done is basically wasted. So that's a fact we can see it quite clearly. Just like that too, in the initial phase, we really put effort okay, to put the mind on the leash within a, a short distance. And after it become quite easy, the doldrum or laziness set in, and at that time, you say, ah, I don't really care. You sometimes, some people keep on doing it, but doing it with that kind of a, a lazy mood. If I do fine, if I don't do fine, 
Uh, some day good, some day bad, callously, take it callously. And if you do that, all the effort you have built up is totally wasted. That's why we must not, and here is, I'm not going to let this be wasted. I'm going to maintain it, I'm going to apply it, so that that little plant that grows can grow bigger and bigger and stronger. So with that kind of attitude, you have to take care of the plant. In the same way here, because of the doldrum phase come in, you must set up your mind. In other words, you must put determination. I'm not going to let whatever I have started be wasted. I'm going to apply as much exertion as needed so that it can grow bigger and stronger. So the doldrum phase, so to make it simple, instead of surrendering it, you must even put a lot more exertion and energy than the initial phase. Only then, in the second phase, you can succeed if you apply that. It grows and it grows and it grows. And finally, what happened was, you began to be able to observe not only the rising and falling, many objects rising, falling, okay, basically all the objects of the full foundations, all the physicalities, all the mentalities, emotions, pains, thoughts, <coughs> hearing, seeing, in all aspects, you are starting to be able to manage it. In other words, you have overcome the difficulty of being the doldrum mode or doldrum phase. So that is Nikama Dhatu, and here you overcome that. When you overcome that, what happens is, is it finished? No, it is not finished yet. You are there, you manage it, you have passed the phase one, you have passed the phase two. Okay. After you pass the phase two, what? Because that is already pretty good. Already pretty good. You can observe them quite clearly. Okay. Continuously, uninterruptedly, and whatever objects that are arising. And in here, if you just float it along that way, what happens is, you will never reach the end, the final phase or the third phase. The final phase or third phase is, in here what you do is, again, the exertion must not yeah, lax. Not only that it lacks, you put an exertion so that you can see the object. Okay, you have already seen the object, okay, rising movement, Okay, the beginning, the middle, the end, falling movement, beginning, little, end, and all other things. You can quite steadily see them. In your mind, it is pretty good. But in here, you have to set the mind up. You have to sign up. I am going to see these objects with more clarity and more sharpness. That is the mindset. So the mindset is in everywhere. In the first phase, okay, in the first phase, you have a mindset. So in other words, you have to set a goal for the initial phase. I am going to observe this rising and falling movement steadily so that it will be continuous. That is the mindset or the objective. And the second phase, your mindset is, I am going to overcome this doldrum or laziness. Okay? In other words, that laziness is simple word, but it is quite difficult when that comes set and if that took holds of it, it's pretty difficult. So you have to overcome a very difficult stage. In other words, at that level, your mindset or the goal is, I am going to overcome this doldrum difficult phase. That's a Second objective, 
each of the objective. When you are in grade one, you have to pass the grade one. When you are in grade two, you have to pass a grade two. Now you are in grade three. Grade three is you are quite well versed. And if you just slide it on, you will drift it away just with that. Now the mind has to be set. Or the mindset or the goal is each object that I have now seen, okay, everything that I have experienced continuously without much break, these objects I'm going to see them with more clarity, more sharpness, and more details. That is the mindset or the third goal you have to set in. Goal number three. Each stage you have to set a goal. And in here is with that mindset you observe and as soon as you set the mind, the mind inclined towards it. You have seen the rising movement, the beginning and the middle and the end. Okay. When you pass the second phase. And the third phase you are still seeing this, the beginning, the middle and the end. And when you are mindset you can see that, number one, just to put in a practical level so that you can correlate. You see the beginning of the movement, middle of the movement, end of the movement. And between the middle and the end, uh, between the beginning and the end, there are middle are many different mini movements in between. So in other words, you can see about seven, eight, nine, ten movements in between, or even sometimes you can't count 10, 20, 30 movements. And at the same time, when you are seeing these things, you can also sense and feel the pressure. You can feel the stiffness. You can feel the fullness. Sometimes you can feel or sense the little longer pause between one and the other. In other words, those are the ones that when your mind set, I'm going to see them clearly and sharply. Clear and sharply with more details. When your mind set that, you're starting to see. All that you need is you set your mind in that direction and automatically to be able to have that, the exertion of energy is already increasing. That is the third exertion, the third exertion of energy. So when you apply that, then you begin to see in details. So when you see in details, that is the third phase. And the third phase, what, to be able to see that each and every object, okay, that is called uh, term, but they come out that too, the third phase or the final phase. In other words, you have finished the phase. So in here, we just talk about phase one, phase two, and phase three. Okay. Okay, you can think in terms of, okay, let's put it this way. Uh, the first month is phase one, the first, second month is phase two, the third month is phase three. You can look at it that way and also, in general, it falls to it. But at the same time, within one day, you will be experiencing phase one, phase two, phase three, too. Don't think that you have passed the phase one after a month, you won't see that. Because every condition is different. Every day is different. Every environment is different. Every mental state is different. Based on the condition it is. So this phase one, two, and three comes don't think I'm a novice or I'm experienced or I'm expert. That is in general way phase one, two, three comes. To become experts you come past phase three. But at the same time in a day, in an hour sitting, phase one, two, three comes. Keep that in mind. So don't lax. Don't lax. The key thing is not to get lax. So when you have these three level. In other words, a person is developing the mind, bhavana, okay, developing the mind. When he's developing the mind, he's putting this kind of 
phase one, phase two, and phase three, initial phase, doldrum phase, and liberating or final phase, phase three. And when you have all those three, okay, when you have applied those three, and when you can do that skillfully, and at that moment, that person become the possessor of the yoga. In other words, at that moment, the person become yogi. Yoga is the exertion of energy. Of course, you can apply energy for many reasons, many purposes, but in here is number one, to make the mind pure. To make the mind pure. In other words, to make the pure mind, wholesome mind, repeatedly arise. In other words, they are the majority of consciousness that is arising. There are many types of consciousness, but this is a specific group, and you are trying to develop the environment so that this type of consciousness can arise with a higher frequency. And also, there's another mind, the mind with the wisdom. The mind with the wisdom also arises. So those two types of consciousness okay, do arise with the greater and higher frequency. That's what we are doing. That's what we are. That's why we are developing the mind, culturing the mind. If you want to go in details and technicality, that is what we are doing. So, in here, you have you become the possessor of this exertion of effort to produce the pure mind and the wise mind. So, when you are developing, that is one way of approach. But we all know in another way. The Buddha taught us in many different ways from many different angles. In another way, you also know we are developing five controlling mental faculties. Now we are looking at a different direction. So every time we are observing, we are developing the five controlling mental faculties. Okay. Sadda, faith and confidence, Varya, effort, Sati, mindfulness, Samadhi, concentration, and Pinya, wisdom. You are developing those five. Okay. I present to you in one way. Now another way is you are developing the five controlling mental faculties. The same thing, you are doing that. But whenever we are practicing this controlling five mental faculties, what is happening? At the beginning, we all develop, okay, or sadha, faith, I have it, effort, I'm putting it, sati, I have the mindfulness, I have concentration, I know what the true natures of mind and matters are. You think you have it, but actually, you don't have it. That's why the word developing is there. You are developing there. At the beginning, you don't have it. You don't possess it. Of course, in general, the nature, okay, the nature of the traces of these five mental faculties are with every one of us. We have a certain degree of faith, a certain degree of effort. We all vary. We all have it. So these are the five controlling mental faculties. These are the positive dharma that we are developing. These are with us, but they do not shine. They are with us, but they do not shine. And what we are doing is we are shining. We are trying to shine these five mental faculties with every observation. And with each observation, with each application, with three levels of exertion, what happened was we are starting to shine these five controlling mental faculties to the point they are called bala. Okay, they call pensing driya five controlling mental faculties, and then there's another what called 
Bala, been changed Ria. In other words, there's another adjective, Bala, is added into the been changed Ria. Five controlling methods. What does Bala mean? Bala means strength and power. Strength and power. In other words, these five controlling mental faculty become powerful and strong. So that's what we are doing. We are trying to develop the powerful five controlling mental faculty, strong five controlling mental faculties. And let's call it these five controlling mentalities Dhamma. Okay, Dhamma can be applied to anything. So now we know in this context, these five are the Dhamma. And every one of us have Dhamma. But when we develop it, we have a Dhamma Bala. Strong and powerful Dhamma, we possess it. In other words, that's the point. It becomes shining. So what we are doing is we are exerting okay, energy to make these Dhamma become powerful and strong powerful and strong dharma for us. So when they become powerful, what happened? So first and foremost, we need to know what this five does. The five does is the first one, sada, faith or confidence. Faith or confidence you know, plunk you to a certain okay, starting point of a course. Okay, starting when you plunked in certain verse so that you won't get stray. You have a belief in it. Because of the belief, okay, you believe you're going to win this 100 meter race, you enter. You are one of the eight. You're ready. When the bell rings, you will start running straight because you have a belief in yourself that you can win. Sada. And then secondly, what? Wariya, effort. So in here is, let's forget about the whole example. Let's go directly in the Dharma. Dharma is, we are developing this five controlling mental faculties. We are practicing bhavana, mental culture, culturing a mind, to become a bhavana bala. Powerful bhavana. That's what we are trying to do. And when we do the powerful bhavana, and when we practice bhavana, what are we doing? Number one is we would be able to observe every object that is arising continuously and interruptedly. That is the one requirement, or that is one of the goal of bhavana. Another goal of bhavana is what? To be able to block all akusala, anything that is unwholesome, bad, evil, to be able to block that. That is another goal of bhavana. And the third goal is to be able to develop all that is wholesome, kusala, doing all wholesome thing, kusala. That is the another goal of bhavana. Okay, bhavana has many goals, starting with continuous observation, secondly, block all the angles of akusala, thirdly, open up all the kusala, <coughs> and finally, to be able to understand okay, every situation and condition in its true nature as it is. Those are the objectives of bhavana, okay, mental development. So in here, we started with the faith. We practice this. When we practice this, what do we do? We exert okay, energy. We exert energy to do what? To be able to observe every object that is arising at the moment. By doing so, if you can apply that, if you can observe, to put effort to do that, what are we doing? We are having a battle. We are having a battle or a war with kilesa, mental defilement. That's what we are doing. Every time, every moment, we are raging war with mental defilements. So whenever we put effort, what we do was, we are actually pushing back these 
mental defilements. Mental defilements are attacking you all the time. Whether you know it or not, they are attacking all the time, every moment. And whenever you exert energy and observe an object, that is the pushback. That's what effort does. And after you push back, what happened? When you push back, you gain ground in that little moment, that ground. So in that ground, what you have occupied, so that the mental defilements cannot come back in, you put a, you build a wall, you build a gate. And that wall, that gate is sati mindfulness. You push it with the effort, and then you build a wall and a gate. What is that wall, that gate? That gate is sati mindfulness. You build a wall. And then once you build a wall, that is the job of the sati. It always guard so that mental defilements cannot seep in. And in here, the third one is samadhi, concentration. So concentration job is in that area that you have gained, at that place where you have built walls and gates, within that, you put a perfect security system so that no mental defilements can exist. You perch the mental defilements behind the wall inside. Because when you have samadhi, no mental defilements can exist. That is what it is. So that's what each of the controlling faculties, they have their job, they have their function, and they are doing it. They are functioning it. And when you have that kile size, first of all, push back, secondly, build gates, nothing can come in, thirdly, inside, you fill it up with in such a way that they cannot grow when you get to that level. You occupy them totally. When you occupy them totally, mental defilements cannot come in. When the mental defilements cannot come in, that is called purity of mind. That is when you reach the purity of mind. Don't think it comes automatically. It comes with sadha, faith. And then you apply effort. And then put the guard on with sati. And then make sure everybody, every space is occupied with soldiers of concentration. At that moment, you have the purity of mind. In other words, phase one of the war is accomplished. Purity of mind, the purpose, the goal. The purpose and goal is to purify the mind. Purity of mind. You got it now. So when you got it, that is the explaining with the five controlling mental faculties. But let's go back to actual field that what we are doing. We are practicing what? Observing, 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 observing. Okay? Every object that comes in, observe, observe, observed. And we use the word, we have the purity of mind. At that moment when you are observing, on a practical field, how can you know you are the supervisor of that field? So you must know there must be an indicator how it is. The indicator is that observation of all objects that are arising. Okay? It becomes automatic before you have to have an initial phase, doldrum phase, and the final phase. And in here, there's no this level or that level of application apply. Automatically, these observations become automatic with precision. Okay. You are observing and you seem like everything is so easy. Objects are arising and you are right there, right there, right there, right there, right there, right there. Auto precision of observation. And when you reach that sort of practicality, auto-precision of observation is reached, you know that 
you have the first full mental faculties because you have the purity of mind. Okay. Every object comes in, it is there, it is there, observing, observing, observing. And when you have the automatically observing the object, what is that? That mean, in a way, if you want to look at a single moment, what are you doing? The object arising, you directly aim and apply the thoughts or awareness onto the object. What is it called? It is called samasinkapa, the right thought, one of the eightfold noble paths, samasinkapa. So automatically, if you are in an auto mode of observation with precision, in other words, you have opened up the path of that noble eightfold path, samasinkapa. That path, that meginga, that road is totally open. That's what is happening. I'm trying to show you what in practice exactly what you're experiencing, how that can be explained, and exactly where you are. You have, you are on the path of samasinkapa. Okay, samasinkapa. The path of applying the mind onto the object is open. That is a part of the wisdom. That path is wide open. When that path is wide open, if you look at it, at that moment, you have closed the, all the roads of akusala, unwholesomeness. In other words, you have abandoned the akusala, unwholesomeness. You have abandoned the evil. And in here, one must understand the meaning, the precise meaning of the word abandon. Abandon doesn't mean you have abandoned and you have washed away all the negative and bad things you have done in the past. There's nothing to do with it. Abandon the akusala means you have okay, totally stop the arising of any akusala chaita in your mind. There's akusala chaita, akusala, unwholesome consciousness are not able to arise in that field. That is called abandoning the akusala. And also, as you are observing it, this is the, what is this we are calling called supreme or the highest form of kusala, wholesomeness. Why is that? The reason is at that moment you know the objects okay, in details, in terms of sequence, which is middle, beginning, and the end, and all its associated qualities, frequency, pattern, nature, formula, you know them exactly without thinking, without reflecting, without fingering out, simply experiencing it. That means you have the right view, the right view, samadhiti, the right view of the object that you are observing in a complete and detailed sense. You have totally have the ownership of wisdom, the ownership of wisdom. Before, of course, you know all these things. You have read many books, you have listened to many YouTubes, you have listened to many Dharma talk. you know exactly all these things are. But at this moment, okay, you know these things intuitively. So the first one that you know is, is called reflective, okay, reflective knowledge. A lot of thinking process going on. And the second one is, you can call it intuitive knowledge or wisdom. This one is through direct experience. That's the difference between the two knowing. The first one is 
through all these studies and listens and figuring out and using your intelligence and logic and analytical power. Second one is intuitively you know all these things without using any of those intellectual prowess. That's a different. And that is wisdom or binya, five controlling mental faculties. So in here, what is it? What's the purpose of practicing this bhavana? The purpose of practicing bhavana is, number one, to block all the possibilities or part of akusala or evils and bad nature to arise, unwholesomeness to arise. You blocked it, you abandoned it. Secondly, you have opened up a floodgate of wholesome, highest form of wholesome consciousness. They come in and they arise with repeated frequency. And because of that, you began to experience the true natures of all these situations and conditions and the object that you are observing at every moment. You have the wisdom. You have purified the mind. You have gained the wisdom. And that is the, the goal or the object of bhavana. You already got it. So in terms of if you want to go back to the literature or theory aspect of it. At that moment, you understand, okay, this is nama, this is rupa, this is the body, and this is the consciousness. This is physical phenomenon, mental phenomenon. With clarity, with absolute clarity and sharpness, without any doubt. And also, their relationship, their walking relationship, through causal relationship. That one too, with direct experience, you understand it. And you know, and everything that you have observed, all these physicality and mentality, beginning, middle, and the end, which means you understand the nature of anicca. And then this rising and passing away is constantly happening all the time. And that is the understanding of dukkha. And then finally, you know that this arising and passing away cannot be controlled. It's happening in its own accord. That is anatta. And also, you see every object with clarity and sharpness. Okay? They arise and pass away, arise and pass away. Your Sati is super strong. The way you know, the way you are aware of this object is super strong. Okay. How strong, how do you know, is, let's say you are alone in your house. Let's say you are afraid or scared of somebody might come in or some ghost, or something like that. It's very quiet. So what happened? You sit in the middle of your living room, eyes closed because you're scared, but at the same time, you're sharp. Your ears and antennas are everywhere. Whenever there's a little creak, you know. Whenever the little crack, you know. Whatever little sound, you know. The slightest, the faintest sound, you suddenly know from this direction, that direction, and your ear is open and alert, and every little movement and sound, you are acutely aware. That kind of awareness you have in this sati, ala sati, when your mindfulness has become powerful and strong, when we become a bala, Every object that you are observing, you know with that kind of sharpness. That is called sati bala. And then faith too. Faith is before you believe. Because you believe, you practiced it. 
If you don't believe, you don't practice. You have faith, you have sadha. But when you come to the state of When the varia effort, sati, mindfulness, and concentration is powerful enough to push back the kilesa mental defilements, what happened was at that moment the calm set into you. This is actually you are experiencing in your practice. The calm set in, very calm, and there's a certain kind of Clarity without any object. The calmness, the light, clarity, and a brightness without light. You will experience it. That calm, clear, bright, and cool feeling. Let's call it a feeling. That is sada. Sada, before it was your intellectual concept understanding. Now you are experiencing sattā directly, calm, cool, clear, and bright without light. Very nice feeling, very, very nice, pleasant feeling. That is sattā in reality, in direct experience, in your practice. And that sattā is called Sadabala, the power of faith, the powerful faith, the strong faith, the strong confidence in the experiential way of sada. Your sada become bala, sada bala, sati bala, and the effort. Effort we always have to apply effort. Okay, low we have to increase up. Uh, too much restless we have to reduce it. That's what we are doing all the time. And when you have reached this stage, the effort become auto-adjusted. Effort and concentration adjust by itself. If it is too much, they adjust by themselves. If it is too little, they adjust by themselves. Effort auto-adjust to every condition. That is bala viriya powerful and strong effort. Concentration. Concentration is, in this one, is not one-pointed concentration on one object. Every object that comes in, you are with it. You stay with it from the beginning to the end. You don't stray, your mind doesn't disperse. And it is always in sync, in sync, in sync. That is Samadhi bala, powerful and strong samadhi. And then pinya. Pinya, and we are talking about, we just talk about the full insight. Okay. Namarupa, brejeda, jnana, okay. discriminative awareness of mind and matter, walking relation, causal relation of mind and matter, anicca, dukkha, anatta, understanding, and the arising and passing away with such a clarity. We are talking only for that level. We are not talking to the end of the road yet. When you reach to that bala state, okay, binya bala, powerful and strong wisdom, is you have this full insight level with such control and skill. You possessed it. That's what it is. In other words, your path is widely open, totally. You are on the highway which will go directly to Nibbana. You are on the road. You are on the path. So we haven't talked about finally reaching Nibbana. We are only talking about how the five controlling mental faculties can be called as strong and powerful five controlling mental faculties. Once you have that, you are on the highway to Nibbana, straight. May all of you be able to practice
Satipatthana Vipassana meditation and, and may you be able to attain Bhavana Bala, strong and powerful mental culture as soon as possible. Sadhu, 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 Buddham Bhujami. Dhammam Bhujami. Sangam Bhujami. Thank you very much.